Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States and Mrs. Reagan, and the Vice President of the United States and Mrs. Bush. Mr. President, Mrs. Reagan, Bush, distinguished and for the purpose of making a very important introduction, I am pleased to introduce Maureen Reagan. Thank you. Six years ago, America began a path into a future, a future of prosperity, a future of opportunity, a future of economic freedom, and away from a past because of one man who led our party out of the wilderness and into the next century. He sees in America and in all of us, the very best that we can be. And he is so intense in his belief in us that he makes each of us want to be what it is he sees. And that's because he's the best. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. You know, in light of some things that Jack Gavin said up here about the vicissitudes of this particular job and so forth, I have to tell you that sometimes, and uh, quite a bit recently, I found myself thinking about the farmer that was driving a, uh, his horse and wagon into town for a truckload of grain and had a head-on collision with a truck. And he was lying there, injured, and some that were going to be permanently disabling, he claimed, and subsequently there was the legal things that took place and the insurance company involved and all, and he was on the witness stand, and the lawyer said to him, isn't it true that when you were lying there at the scene of the accident, someone came over to you and asked you how you felt, and you said you never felt better in your life? We well, said, yeah, I, I guess I remember saying that. No further questions. Well, a little later, another lawyer on the other side had him on the stand and said to him, when you made that statement about how you felt, what exactly were the surrounding circumstances? Well, he said, I was lying there. And he said, a car came up. A deputy sheriff got out. He said, my horse was neighing and kicking. He'd broken two legs. And the deputy sheriff drew his revolver and put it in the horse's ear and pulled the trigger. And he said, then my dog was whining with pain. He'd broken his back and went over to him and he put the gun in his ear and killed him. <laughs> and he says, then he started toward me and he says, now how are you feeling? <laughs> Thank you.
But let me say right now, I, I can't tell you how proud I am of the job that Maureen is doing at the RNC. Before I go any farther, there are a few other people I want to give special greetings to. One is a distinguished former ambassador who got his start in the same line of work that I did. Tonight's co-chairman, I've just mentioned Ambassador John Gavin. And then there's the chairman of our party, no history of our times and what we've done these last six years to set America back on track will be complete without noting the monumental contribution of Frank Ferenkopf. And the same is true with the man who's helping to lay the financial foundation for the party, Keith Brown. Now, I hope you'll forgive me if I'm a little nostalgic for a moment. That's what happens when you get to be my age. And besides, getting together with the Eagles always seems to do that to me. You've been with us every step of the way as we've worked to bring America back. You were with us as we worked to bring down interest rates and inflation from historic highs, to get ahead of steam back into America's economic locomotive, and to stop the decade-long drop in the Americans' family's real income. It's hard to remember those days when our nation's leaders talked about no growth, the era of limits, and that other term, malaise, that seems a long time ago, now that we can look back on 50 months of economic expansion, on 13 million more jobs, on more new businesses than in any comparable period in our history, on manufacturing productivity that's going up at the fastest pace in more than 20 years, and on a stock market that has gone up farther in the last four years than it had in the nearly two centuries since it was founded. Yes, in just six years, we've left malaise in the dust, and now all around the world, and in every language, there is a new way to spell opportunity, and that is USA. <laughs> and that's not all. In the last six years, America has begun to rebuild its defenses. We are once again standing where we should be around the world with those who put their lives on the line to fight for freedom. And as long as I've got this job, there's no way we will abandon them, not in Afghanistan, not in Angola, not in Cambodia, and not in Nicaragua. Today, we're giving the world a new hope that just a few years ago it didn't even dare to dream about. But the hope of the genius of American technology will soon lift from the mind of man the fear of ballistic missiles. Whether missiles launched in a war that cannot be won and must never be fought, or missiles launched in some horrible accident. Yes, we've given mankind a new hope for peace and security, a strategic defense initiative. And when the time has come and the research is complete, yes, we're going to deploy. <laughs> now, now, as you know, even as we've been doing all this, there's been a chorus off to the left singing various songs of gloom. First, it was that we would ruin the economy. And then it was that the recovery wasn't real. And now, with America having gained more manufacturing jobs in the last four years than either Europe or Japan, it's that America is de-industrializing. Well, forgive me, but when I look back on 12 months in which that chorus of gloom singing loudly all the time, we enacted aid to the freedom fighters in Nicaragua, got going on the first real attack on the federal deficit in years, and gave America a tax reform package that all the inside the Beltway pundits said was an impossible dream. You know, when I look back on all that, I just keep thinking, that's not bad for a disengaged lame duck. <laughs> and now they're saying that after the last elections and the Iran controversy, we've run out of steam. Well, six years ago, they were saying I was too old. Now they're saying our administration is too old. 
You know, it reminds me of a story about that cub reporter. His first assignment was to go out to the senior citizen's home where there was a gentleman that was just approaching his 100th birthday. And he arrived and introduced himself and said, you're Mr. Brown? He said, yes. And naturally, the first question was, to what do you owe your longevity? And the old boy said, well, I never drank, I never smoked, I never ran around with wild women. And just then, there was a big crash up above their head on the next floor. And the kid said, what was that? The old man says, oh, hell, that's dad. He's drunk again. <laughs> you know, I ha can't help noticing that the people who say that our revolution is over always seem to be the same people who wished it had never begun. But what <laughs> But what they don't understand is we came to Washington to do a job, and I believe the American people want us to finish it. In November, we did something unprecedented for a party in its sixth year in the White House. We held our own in the House and lost far fewer Senate seats than is normal in a second year off-term election. In fact, lost fewer than has ever been done. We lost the Senate in five cliffhanger elections, and they turned on a cumulative margin of a total for all five of only 29,000 votes. And we picked up governorships. Was it eight, I believe? In fact, we now have governors in states that give us a majority of the electoral vote. No party has ever done that well overall in the sixth year of a single administration. So the American people spoke loud and clear as November, as they have for the last six years. They want us to continue to keep taxes down. They want us to continue to appoint judges who are tough on crime. They want us to continue to build a strong defense. They want us to continue to fight for the basic values and rights that our families, our neighborhoods, and our nation have been built on, including the right to life. And they want us to continue to work for a world without nuclear missiles and in which nuclear missiles are obsolete. That's what the American people want us to do. And that's what we said we were going to do. And that's what we will do. We have a long, unfinished agenda and just two years left. Just two years to change our welfare system from a trap that drags people into dependency to one that is a ladder on which they can climb out into productive lives. Just two years to make America more competitive so that American business and the American worker can meet and beat any international competitor anywhere in the world. Just two years to set the world economy on a path that will carry all nations to the highlands of lasting prosperity. I mean a world of fair and free trade. And just two years to set aside our nation's biggest obstacle to the second or the secure future of growth and jobs by moving toward a balanced budget. The liberals are talking now of repealing Graham Rudman Hollings and raising taxes. You know, the way they misread what the American people want reminds me of another story. Three fellows went into a restaurant. And they were giving their orders. The one fellow said to the waitress, I was here last week, and I got a dirty glass. And then he ordered a glass of milk. And he says, but make sure it's in a clean glass this time. Well, the other two fellows ordered milk also. And when the waitress came back, she had the three orders of milk. And she says, now, which one gets the clean glass? <laughs> My friends, our unfinished agenda is not just a Reagan agenda and not just a Republican agenda. Our agenda is America's agenda. It's been our guide on our journey for these last six years. And now we're at a fork in the road. Our path carries us back down to the dismal, stagnant swamps of the nearly forgotten past toward a place where government can do anything except adequately defend our country. The other path, the one we want, continues us up toward the mountain meadows, toward the snow-capped peaks from where we can look out 
onto a future of growth and opportunity for America. Freedom for those struggling against totalitarian oppression around the world, and peace for all mankind. If America is to continue to follow the rising path, it will need strong climbers, and that means you eagles. Think of how far America has come in the 12 years since the eagles began. The hardest journey is behind us. The greatest adventures are yet to come. Let us join together to keep America climbing that mountain path. Let us do it not just for ourselves, but for our children and their children and for the generations to come. Thank you and God bless you all. Thank you, Mr. President. Maureen and I, as uh, co-chairman of this event tonight, want to thank you, Mr. President, Nancy, Mr. Vice President, Barbara, all of you, all of you who are here for being here with us tonight. Again, to thank the Vice Chairman, but particularly to thank all of you Eagles who contributed and who, more importantly, contributed by your presence and by your support. I think we also should thank, they're not up here with us, our spouses, my wife Connie and all of the other spouses of the vice chairman are over there at, uh, at that part of the, of the audience. And finally, we would like to say to you that this party goes on till one o'clock. You're invited to dance till then, have a wonderful time, and then go home safely. Good night. Thank you.